Good morning, and welcome to this exploration of how your life plan is created from your past lives. And let's get in touch with the source of all energy, all life and strength, the source of love and wisdom by doing our prescription for spiritual alignment together. We are aligned with the presence of God within. We are protected by God's love, wisdom, knowledge, and grace. The God consciousness within helps us discover more about who we are. Thank you, God, for the gift of spiritual intuition. Thank you, God, for aligning our conscious, subconscious, and superconscious minds. Take a deep breath and let it out and move into this shared space. We share the space together, whether we're watching live or whether we're watching on a recorded video. We are one in spirit. There is no time and no space separating us. And in this oneness, we give thanks. Amen. Well, how are you doing in looking at your past life experiences and your life plan? I know you've been examining your life to see if you've been getting some clues as to what past life experiences have been bleeding through into this lifetime. And there's a video that um, Jane had uh, shared in which she talked about the little eyes and likened them to a cake being baked. And that each of the different lifetimes, the little eyes that we've had, all these different lifetimes are different ingredients in the cake of this particular personality self, this lifetime that has come together, made up of the ingredients that have all blended together from, uh, in my case, from Germany in the year 1000 and China in 1100 and uh, North America in 1200 and uh, different parts of the world, different personality selves, male, female, different races, different classes, all of which are different ingredients that are blended together and were put together to be designed to support your soul. And that cake that was baked was made of the different ingredients. Another visual that Jane has used is the little eyes as the little lowercase eyes. So here's uh, Germany and there's China and there's the, the uh, uh, Native American and there's the priest and there's the American loyalist. And they go through one after another and they're all kind of strung together, but they're a lower self. They're lower case because this is the lower self, the lower consciousness eyes, which are all evolving, supported by what? A greater eye. And this is the I am presence, the soul of you, the higher self. And as someone shared recently to me, we can slog through these different lifetimes unconsciously working out our karma and doing these experiences and having successes and failures, always evolving. So it's all a progressive um, journey. But if we really want to make progress, if we really want to have an experience of our whole self and move into a greater awareness, we have to move our consciousness into that directive eye that I, which is above and beyond and behind all these little experiences. And this I is your soul self, your higher self, your infinite self, that part of you that is seeking to express and awaken, fully awaken in God. 
And when we begin to move our consciousness into this higher self, we do so through the means of the observer self. This is that higher perspective, that reconnaissance from above, where we can look down into these lifetimes and become aware of those experiences that perhaps have baffled us up until now. Why did I act like that in that situation? How come I reacted this way? Why did I change completely from this very uh, do-good person who was always trying to be an obedient child to I went off to college and partied myself into a stupor? Who, who was that person uh, who did that? And then I had children and I, I, I became very, very religious. And, um, oh, I just became so religious because I wanted to rebel against that uh, college self of me. And then I didn't get my needs met as a spiritual student, a spiritual being. And so I awakened to uh, a, a deeper spiritual teaching. And these different lives, uh, these different chapters in this lifetime of yours are sourced in their energy in each of those different little eyes that you lived through in past lives. And before you came into this lifetime, you met with the karmic board, the Lords of Karma, and you designed this lifetime based on and made up of the ingredients of all those little selves from all those past lives, the salt and the sugar and the flour and the vanilla and the eggs and whatever else goes into a cake because I've never made a cake from scratch in my life. But you, even if you haven't, you know what we're talking about, that, that, that something doesn't come out of nothing, that the lifetime that you're leave, leading right now did not come out of a void. It came out of the experiences that you have laid down in the journey that you have been on for eons and eons of time, not only as a human being, having hundreds of lifetimes, but as an animal and going back before that to plant and before that to mineral, the consciousness is always evolving. And so you are made up of all of these past experiences. And these past experiences make up you. They are baked into your cake, so to speak. And when you're going through a situation in your life, there's an overlay. There's an overlay of one of those lifetimes because there's always a, a, a lead uh, personality from a past life that takes precedence in any period of time in your life. In the last couple of weeks, I had some very rude awakenings. I found myself in some very old and familiar judgmental attitudes, a consciousness which I recognized. And as I shared it with a friend of mine, a spiritual friend, he said, man, I haven't seen this guy in a long time, Greg. What's going on? And sure enough, it was the Chinese governor, the warlord from 1200, 1100 AD, uh, and he had been uh, under the thumb of the barbarian invaders of the north, the people who later become uh, the Mongols and who laid waste over all of Eastern Europe and the steppes of Central Asia, the Genghis Khans and the Kublai Khans. Well, in their earlier, how they took over China, I was on the front lines and I was on the Chinese side. And I saw those people as barbarians and they were wrong. And there was a part of me that made a judgment, that made a decision. I'll be darned if I'm going to let somebody dominate me and uh, I'm going to tell them before they can tell me. And anyone who has known me in my lifetime has known that that's been an aspect of my being. It's an overlay that came over that was almost like taking a transparency with some information and it overlaid the life, the personality self that I am in this lifetime. And so I found myself internally reacting in the last couple of weeks, a couple of three times with judgments that were shocking to me, but which were uh, apparent in my past experiences. But it was for me to forgive 
another chunk from the iceberg, another piece of consciousness that's hidden under the surface of my conscious mind. And uh, I'm going to show you this iceberg here. This is found in spiritual power tools. And so this little chunk that we could label the uh, Chinese governor who feels he's superior and he has a greater culture. You know, the, the barbarians who came down didn't have a lot of uh, literacy and they didn't have a lot of art and they didn't have a lot of culture. In fact, when they finally took over, they just adopted all of the cultures, uh, all of the Chinese cultures, um, different attributes. So I thought I was superior. And that's that part of myself that thinks he's big stuff, but there's those barbarians out there. And these judgments show up in me politically. I think that uh, people who are, you know, about might and force and, and warlike, like I felt the barbarians were, why they're just a bunch of barbarians and I am superior. And I found myself needing to forgive myself to go in and do my journaling work and forgive that part of myself that thought it was special, that wore silk robes and thought it was wonderful. And in this lifetime, played that same role because I hadn't completed. I hadn't released that past life memory in which I was stuck. Now, it's interesting that in that lifetime, when I was the Chinese governor, I died and created another lifetime, my next lifetime, in which I was the strong warlike person. And I was a, a Native American chief who destroyed his whole tribe because I was so vehement in wanting to dominate and control. And when that didn't work, I decided to have a lifetime as a priest so that I could be good and do it the right way. And when that guy was uh, uh, corrupt and, and made a lot of mistakes, I, I became the person who was very establishment and very wealthy and very worldly and material, who was all for the order of the day. And it goes on and on like this. Now, you trailed behind you into this lifetime, those little eyes, and they at times take turns in your personality self like an overlay over your personality self, they kind of take over. And so you wonder, what's going on? Why am I reacting like this? Or worse yet, you don't even know you're unconscious as to what's going on with yourself. These are all the overlays of the past lives that are coming in to have their voice so that we can forgive them complete them, and let them go. Ask yourself, when you're in a reaction to something, when you feel you're right, or you feel you're terrible, or when you have a strong emotional reaction to something, ask yourself, who is this? Who's showing up here? Now, it's not necessary to identify that past life self as any particular century or culture or location, but you can get a feeling, oh, this is somebody who really felt victimized. Oh, this is somebody who's very dominant and wants to put everybody else down out of some kind of fear. And you can say to yourself, it's not me. This isn't me. This is just a past life experience that is coming in for me to forgive. And even though I may not remember the past life, I sure am aware of what I'm feeling right now. And don't you find at times you're just inexplicable to yourself? You, you react in ways you don't even understand. Where did this come from? It came from somewhere. And where it came from was a past life experience that you can forgive and complete right now, even without remembering the first thing about the facts of that life. Because it's that dominant part of you or that uh, part of you, in my case, I felt victimized and superior. And as you do your journaling work, 
as you observe from that higher observer self, which is that capital I, you can forgive and complete this past energy. And so you no longer have to carry it forward with you. Now, you might complete a certain layer of it, as I had with that Chinese life, but there was a deeper layer that was still operant that needed to come up. And I was in a position where I didn't stay stuck in it as long. You know, there were times when I went on for years with certain beliefs, not knowing where they came from. But as you develop your observer self, and as you cultivate that active observer in you, you more and more get in charge of it, in touch with it. You don't have to go through six weeks of suffering before you finally wake up. In my case, when I found myself judging a situation, it was a matter of maybe a day. And then in a few days later, when I found myself judging, it was a matter of hours. And a few days later, when I found myself in the same kind of judgmental consciousness, it was minutes. And then finally, you find yourself, ah, I know who this guy is. I know that one. And you're not going to be taking over here. It's not me. And that's an affirmation you can say. This is not me. This isn't me. It's not me. This isn't true. And sometimes that's all you need to do. In a situation where you find yourself in a limited consciousness, just say, this isn't true. I'm finding myself in a, a period right now of some change in my life, and it's stirring up. You know, you have circumstances in your life that will stir up your subconscious, like the sediment at the bottom of a pond or, or, or something that gets stirred up in the waters of change and the waters have a current and the current pulls up the muck from the bottom, the subconscious, and you get a chance to release it. You get a chance to let it go. Your observer self allows you to separate or as a, as I've heard Jane use the word bifurcate so that you're in this consciousness, the capital I, and you can look down at your little I self and perhaps even get clues as to the many little eyes that were there. Ask yourself, what is the life that I have created here, my life plan? What did I come in to experience? What did I come in to do? I came into this lifetime with the desire to awaken in my higher self, to wake up in my spiritual nature. That desire was a trap door. That's another image that Jane has used with me. I still remember sitting in her uh, condo uh, many years ago, 30 years ago, and she explained to me that my desire to awaken in God, to spiritually wake up, was a trap door that was available to me, not a slam dunk sure thing. It was my choice and my will that I would put behind my desire to get free of the karma of the many different little eyes, the personality lower self. And that trap door is the desire that you hold the desire that you hold to awaken into your whole self, to fully awaken in your God self, in your spiritual nature. That desire for infinite consciousness, for something more. And perhaps the ladder that you put up to that trap door is the will that you put behind it so that you can climb up and out of the box that you've been in, labeled personality self. To awaken, awaken to your God consciousness. And you'll be tested. Situations will come up. And I've known so many people who said, I really want this more than anything else. This is what I really desire. Oh, more than anything else, I want this. But something happened. They came up against themselves. And it was uncomfortable. And they said, nah, maybe some other time. And went off to do some more karma. But when you say, I really want to know myself in God, and you really mean it, and you back it up with your will, 
you begin the process of what Jane calls involution. You've been evolving through those little eyes, but now you're moving into that greater eye and you dismantle those little eyes. Now, last week I likened uh, the dismantling to, to Legos and that uh, my, my kids would have Lego sets. And then when they would make whatever the model was, they put all the little Legos in a container, a little bucket, and then they pull out the Legos and make new creations. Well, your personality self in this lifetime, the Sally or the Joe or the Greg or whoever you are, was created of the little pieces of karma, the little desires that existed in lives before this one. And when you begin the involutionary journey, you begin the journey of dismantling that and finding out who you really are and letting go of all those little egos, all those little rubber bands in the karmic ball, all those little chunks of ice. We have so many analogies we use, but it's all for the same thing. And you dismantle those lower desires to uncover your greater desire. So write down your desires. That's my challenge this week. For you to write down your desires for this lifetime. And I mean the petty desires as well. You know, I wanted to be good looking. I wanted to have lots of relationships. I wanted to uh, have a a million dollars. I wanted to live on a beach. I wanted this or that. But then start looking at your higher desires. I wanted to help people. I wanted to love and forgive. I wanted to do good in the world. And then see if there's that one trapdoor desire. I want to know God. I want to awaken to my infinite self spiritually. I don't know what language you put to it because it's not about language. It's just the truth of your being. And examine those desires and see how much weight, how much energy you're putting into all of them because you really don't make spiritual progress until your desire is overwhelmingly to move up to this greater I. That the majority The 51% at least of your desire energy in this lifetime is designed to move you out of karma through the trap door and into your higher self. And so you can take stock and see, where am I on this journey? You, this is, I'm going to quote Jane here, and this is her way of putting this. She said, you are an infinite intelligence waiting to hatch. I love that. You are an infinite intelligence waiting to hatch. You are infinite intelligence waiting to be unveiled within you. And so are you ready to begin the process of moving through the trap door? Are you willing to back up your desire? which opens that trap door with the will that is the ladder that you climb to get up and out of that limited part of yourself. And realize as you experience this, the way your spiritual growth will unfold is not going to be so much through um, going to a mountaintop experience and going on spiritual retreats, although that's important. It is important to meditate every day, at least for a few minutes. It's important to do the spiritual things, but as much as anything else, your spiritual progress will be measured by the triggers, the people that trigger you so easily. And you say to yourself, what is this? Why am I being triggered by this person? Uh, Why, when I drive by those political signs, do I get so upset? Why, when I hear on the news or when I Uh, have some bad news, or I call it bad news. Why am I being triggered like this? It's because of a chunk of the iceberg that needs to be forgiven and released and melted. Jane calls this, another analogy, is funny colored glasses. It's the perspectives that we are looking at things through. And they distort and color everything that we do. We have distorted vision. 
the people who are in your life are there because you chose for them to be in your life. And I know when I first heard that, I said, chose? Why would I choose that? I chose that because it was the most effective way, the most efficient way to move through my karma, to forgive, and to bring me to the point of realization that there's more to me. And so thank you to all those people who push my buttons. And I say to my observer self, that capital I, wake me up quicker. Let me not stay stuck in that lower part as long as I've been. And like I've experienced in the last couple of weeks, let it not be a couple of days or a few hours or even a few minutes. Let my observer self be so with it that I awaken to the truth of my being sooner that I come to consciousness of what's really going on sooner. Those past resentments haven't been healed yet. And those past resentments are a part of every incarnation. All of the different experiences that you have will be triggered. Those memories will come up into your consciousness. One of the answers that came to me as I was working on this was focus less on them and more on myself. You know, we take things personally. We forget that the real reason why these things happen in our lives is so we can forgive them and let them go. So ultimately, who cares what's motivating that person? What really matters is what's going on with me. So we don't get caught up, caught up in another person's stuff, that we come from a higher perspective, one that says, that isn't true. That isn't who I am. And just saying that in the middle of those situations, when you find yourself emotional reacting, even if it, even if you really think you believe what you're seeing in an ego sense, just try this out. Say, that's not true. That's not who I am. And then see what then you've opened a little bit crack for something greater to come forth, a different perspective taking off those funny colored glasses, letting go of the distortion and the coloredness of the, of the uh, filters of that past life experience that's coming up in that situation. Another question to ask is, who started it? I remember when Jane first taught that and when I first heard that. When you're in the middle of it, ask yourself, who started it? And you may not know who started it, but you know you had a hand in it. That somewhere in your past lives, maybe you did it to them and they did it to you and you did it to them and you took turns, uh, each of you paying back karma to the other, but nobody forgiving at all. And now in this lifetime, you have the tools to forgiveness. You know how to do the seven steps to successful life transitions, which is found in your spiritual power tools book. You know how to do your journaling and you know how to be in your observer self. And so you can forgive now and get off the karmic wheel with that person so you don't have to come back and go through some of that sorry karma again. I remember when I was going through a situation when I had a, a, a supervisor, and I've shared this before, and I hadn't had any past life memories, but I had a supervisor who was treating me unjustly according to Greg. But when I had this past life memory, I realized that I had done far worse to this person than they were ever doing to me when I was an abbot back in the Middle Ages. And I was getting off easy. And although it was a difficult situation, it was easier to move through it. And ultimately, and it took me a while to do it, to forgive not only the other person, but mostly myself for the way I had treated this other person. In one situation in my life, somebody was treating me very badly and I, I didn't understand why they were looking at me this way. And what came to me as I worked on it was that they had been my little brother and our parents had died in some primitive culture and I was supposed to take care of them, but I didn't. And I abandoned him. 
to himself and he had to fend for himself as a little boy. And so that little boy was very angry with this person and that anger came out. And so I was able to forgive that part of myself and I don't hold resentment about that person anymore. And we see as we do this work that we're part of group karma as well. Our family karma, the different religious organizations and jobs that we're in are groups that have karma. Nations have karma. And that's why when we look at the nat the world scene, there's national karma, which is a group consciousness, which is working itself out in ways that we know not of. So don't get caught up in the story of these things, although you have to acknowledge it. The answer is loving understanding. Loving understanding will move you into that consciousness that's open just a little bit to see things from a higher perspective. Loving understanding is that part that says, maybe I don't have all the answers here. Maybe my being superior and thinking everybody else is a barbarian, maybe that's a limited perspective. And there's another way of looking at things. Maybe loving understanding will open me up to being able to forgive, release, and let go. And to move out of resentment and resistance and revenge, which so often operate in our relationships, in our lives. And as we're doing this work, we have to realize that we created expectations for this lifetime. We brought in with us certain perspectives of religious belief, certain perspectives of even political belief, uh, certain attitudes we hold. That's why it's so ineffective to try to argue with people about these issues because who you're arguing with is really that part of themselves that's beneath the surface of the iceberg. And your lower self and their lower self are never going to get each other to see eye to eye. I was talking to somebody recently who shared that they were raised in a very fundamental background, a home, not exposed to anything else but that. But they knew at a very young age that they just didn't believe those things, that they had a different perspective and their family really wasn't their tribe. Where did that come from? It came from past life experiences and understandings that they brought with them into this lifetime. And whether it's about relationships or about religion, these things are lodged in the icebergs of the people around us. And so the sooner we recognize that we are very unlikely, if not totally unlikely, to get somebody else to agree with us rather than what's in their subconscious iceberg, then we can live and let live and let them be. That doesn't mean you're victimized, but it means you don't try to get people to see things that they do not have the perspective to see because they're wearing those glasses. When we realize that the healing that we're looking for as a soul is found when we lift up into our observer self and stop slogging through these past life consciousnesses so much. When we rise above a five on the spiritual thermometer, when we lift up into our higher self in meditation, then this higher energy, this new energy is allowed to bleed through into our conscious awareness and to find its strength and its voice in our lives. The answer is always loving yourself. Loving yourself enough to not hold on to those resentments towards other people and the demand that everybody see things your way. Loving yourself enough to give yourself some compassion and knowing that you too are working out your karma, forgiving and loving and releasing your past experiences. And 
realizing that there is hope and strength. When you recognize that there is a way out, there is a trap door, and your desire for higher consciousness will give you the awareness that will enable you to forgive those past life situations. You can ask the question, if my soul were in charge, not my ego, how would I look at this differently? If I was in my higher self, that capital I, not the little I with the dot, how might I look at this and handle this differently? And when we do this, and we're really sincere about it, we find we open up to something called intuition. Intuition is very important to your life plan because intuition enables you to take charge in your understanding of those life circumstances so that you're not stuck in them anymore. You are granted a wider vision rather than looking through a peephole, just a limited, narrow vision of your life. And then when you take action, you can do so guided by your intuitive self from a higher vision so that when you insert a cause, take action, it's coming from a higher directive self rather than a, a lower self that always just reacts to things. You really can't ever make a good move, a smart move, when you're stuck below a five on the spiritual thermometer in your lower self, in your personality self. The only healthy causes that you can insert into situations through your action come from your higher self, that higher self that directs your life towards your spiritual awakening. And when you take that action, you're not attached to the results. You're not attached to whether the other people react with kumbaya or whether they're uh, angry at you. You do what you're doing directed by a higher understanding, a loving understanding that comes from your heart. And as you do this work, you'll find that Sometimes your intuition will try to come through with a revelation. A revelation is a deeper understanding that is true, that comes directly from your soul. As she says, from the tip of your toes to the top of your head, and you just know. And when you have those experiences of revelations, sometimes you might feel a little anxiety or a little bit of feeling out of sorts before they land. So that's why it's so important to be kind and loving with yourself. When you feel some anxiety or agitation, sit down, take a deep breath, meditate, journal, and ask the question, what is it that my soul wants me to see here? And then see what happens. A revelation is trying to land in your life. And there's dissonance there between your personality self, which is resisting this newer, higher understanding, and your higher self, and they need to get into alignment and get into sync with one another. And in so doing, by getting quiet, by doing your journaling and your meditation, a revelation can land and it comes from your soul and it brings you back into alignment with your life plan. Otherwise, we find ourselves repeating the same mistakes over and over again. Sometimes when we come into life, we come in with very good intentions, but we forget and we don't learn the lessons that we came in and we agreed to before we came in. Jane, in a video, gave a, an analogy or a, a, an example of a person who lived a life and they were uh, so compassionate towards the poor people who uh, were disadvantaged in their culture. Now, they weren't in any position to really help them much. They did what they could, but they had a burning desire. I wish I would be able to help these people. And they went into their place of worship in that culture and prayed for the opportunity to help those people who were disadvantaged. And sure enough, 
as they plan their next life plan, they met with the board of uh, karma, the lords of karma, the karmic board, and decided, I am going to have the opportunity to have enough money in this lifetime to help people. And they had that ability, the talents, and the abilities to make money and the karma to make money. And then they got to a point where they started enjoying being a millionaire and they decided they wanted to be a billionaire and they didn't help people much at all. And they found themselves getting off of track. And so then they had to come back in some lifetimes and understand through having experiences where they didn't have the money, what it was like to be on the receiving end of that where they were disadvantaged so that when they finally came back and had a lifetime where they had grown to the point where they really would help other people, they could fulfill that desire of their hearts. That's just one example of how these little eyes string together and we learn. And it's all a learning and growing experience. I had that experience as a priest. I had been a very stern abbot and very harsh with people because in my mind, after all, I represented the church and I was right. And that made me, you know, needing to dominate everybody. Well, I decided, no, no, I want to do it right. And so two or three lifetimes down the road, I created a lifetime in which I could become a priest again. And I loved my parish and I truly cared about people. But I was so good at my job, I moved higher and higher up the ladder until I started getting very enamored of the power and the goodies. And in that culture, uh, it was very opulent. I could see myself in ermine robes and eating the finest foods and misbehaving in many different ways. And I got off track. And so in this lifetime, about three, four lifetimes later, I decided to be a minister. And in this lifetime, I tried my best to fulfill that priest's desire because he was very disappointed with himself when he passed over. And he wanted to truly help people and do it the right way according to those desires. So this is how it works. And we work through that with relationships, with gender. I know people, I was one of them, who swore they weren't going to, I've had many lifetimes as a man because I had been abused as a woman. So I swore I wouldn't come back and do that. Well, at some point, you would forgive the, that energy so that you don't have to come back and live that out. As you do your forgiveness work, you move into a higher consciousness, that capital I, where you can in consciousness forgive these things that you carried in with you these decisions that you made, these expectations that you wanted to get fulfilled through desire. And through forgiveness, you can let go of it and begin the process of desiring the one true desire, the infinite consciousness self that you are. And so open the trap door and move into a greater awareness of who you are. And so we're going to take a moment here to have a meditation time. And in this meditation time, we're going to briefly explore the desires that we came in with and then examine, identify, and see that greater desire, the desire for spiritual involution to move beyond the evolutionary path into the involution that says, there is something more. I am something more. And I want to experience my whole self in God. So just close your eyes. And as you move your awareness into your heart, you become aware of all the desires that you carried in with you into this lifetime. all those little eyes, so many desires that you wanted to fulfill. And just take a moment briefly to 
take stock, to inventory those lesser desires. And that doesn't mean they're bad, just personal desires that you came in to experience in this lifetime. Some of them you fulfilled to a certain degree. Some of them you've let go of. But they're designed in such a way that you never fulfill them 100%. There's always something in the opposites that's not quite the fulfillment that you expected. And so whether it's being a musician, having a career, relationships, even religion, whatever desires that you can identify. And just examine and feel how strong they are. Which ones have you let go of? You're done with them. Which ones are still burning in your heart? And how much energy are you putting into these unconscious desires? And now, examine in your heart the desire to know your true self. You will have your own words that you put to this. One person will say, I want to know God. While another person with the same desire will say, I want to wake up in love. I want to get to know my infinite self. I desire to spiritually awaken. However you identify this, how much energy are you willing to put into it? How strong, how burning is the desire of your heart? To know your true self, your infinite self, in God. And as you find yourself and feel yourself lifting up, into that capital I, consciousness, the higher self, the truth of your being. You move in your awareness into that infinite loving understanding. And just rest there, strengthening your desire to awaken, to know, and to be.
thank you. Thank you, infinite loving consciousness. Thank you for revealing what my heart longs to see. Thank you for strengthening my observer self. So that I can more quickly move into that higher self, that capital I of me that knows. And so now as we bring ourselves back into the chair that we're in, the room that we're in, we feel the stirrings of gratitude in our hearts. So we know we are plugged in. We're plugged into our intuition. We've strengthened our observer self and we strengthen the desire of our heart. And so just open your eyes and look around and know that Everyone else is here to support you too. And we invite you to um, support the Center for Enlightenment, the, the uh, donation buttons in the chat room or on the website. And also, um, please come on Thursday night, 7 p.m. Eastern. We have a wonderful support group and you can just listen or you can participate but you'll go much, much deeper than we're able to do in these Sunday classes. And so until then, or until next Sunday, bye for now. <laughs>